So we're learning a uh, discourse from the Rebbe, from Shabbos Parshas Baal Leisachal, uh, 1969. And it was actually edited by the Rebbe himself and distributed in 1992. So it's a, uh, a very essential discourse, I would say, of the Rebbe, a mimer of the Rebbe. And um, it's printed in Malukat, in the edited discourses of the Rebbe, uh, in the fifth volume, uh, volume Hay. And it is entitled, Baalei Secha Es Haneres, which means to fire up the lamps. Oh, Aaron, you're in an amazing place. You're on a sailboat. Amazing. <laughs> I think the first time someone's been on a sailboat in one of my classes. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. That's all cool. Wow. So you're on the water. We're going to talk a lot about fire today. We're going to go the other direction. We're going to go from fire. You're in the water. I'm on the fire. I'm also on the land over here in the background. you got the green trees. So in this week's Parsha, it says, talks about the lamps of the menorah. And the lamps of the menorah are obviously symbolic of the soul of a Jew. And in the Parsha, it talks about literally the commandment to actually light up the menorah itself. And it says to light up the menorah on the face of the menorah. And it says that the neirais themselves, the candles themselves, are the soul of a human being, of a Jew. And the soul of a Jew is like a candle of God. As it says, Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. And Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam means literally the lamp or candle of God is the soul of man. So each of the lights on the menorah symbolizes our soul. So the question is, how do we get to connect to that concept that God needs a candle? Like, why does God need a light? God is the light. And then, why are there seven lights? What is the concept that there are seven different souls? So, one of the things is, there's seven qualities of the souls of Jews. Seven different qualities of souls, or categories of qualities of souls. Different souls have a certain proclivity for this or a certain proclivity for that. And each soul is unique in its own way. But generally speaking, there's seven different, sort of say, categories of the soul. And then, like one of the examples that is given is a person serves Hashem like water. We were talking about water with Aaron. He serves Hashem like water, which is chesed, which is kindness, which is love. And then... We have one that burns like a fiery flame of love, which is like fire. So these are two distinct ways of serving Hashem, two distinct ways our souls relate to God. So there's an amazing uh, explanation in a discourse by the fourth Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shmuel, and it says, that the neshama is called neirais, as we say, Hashem says to the person, you are my candle. In your, my candle is in your hand, and my candle is in your hand. So, based on this discourse from exactly a hundred years before this one was said, we have this understanding that God says to man, my lamp is in your hand, and your lamp is in my hand. So, that always reminds me of um, the song, Aiko Waiko. My, my grandma says to your grandma, and your two fires, set your pants on fire. So, what does it mean though? Number one, my lamp is in your hand. What is Hashem's lamp? My lamp, Hashem says, is the Torah. We got dogs barking in the background. Chabad house backyard. Look at this, the encore, the energy of, we got uh, the animal energy. My lamp is in your hand is the Torah. It says, Ner mitzvah v'tayra er. The lamp of mitzvahs and the light of the Torah. So that is my lamp in your hand, God says. God gives us the Torah, and He places the Torah in our hand. He gives us the blueprint for all creation. He gives us the manual for God's divine plan. And He says, I'm placing it in your hand. I'm giving it to you. This is for you. And the Torah, we just came from Shavuos, where we received the Torah Mount Sinai. This in and of itself has the quality of God trusting us, God giving us a gift and entrusting us with His Holy Torah. We know the sto story of the uh, Medrash 
that the angels protested and said, why are you giving it to human beings? They're frail, they're, 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 they're you know, they have good days, they have bad days, they're, they're humanistic, they're limited, give it to us. And the, the, the short version of the long story is, is that, Moses, that the, Moses shows the angels that God commanded the Torah specifically to the Jewish people and specifically to enlighten humanity, not for perfect beings to observe it, but for frail people, for people with humanistic tendencies, people with things that are lacking, and they need Hashem, Hashem's Torah, in order to perfect themselves and perfect the world at large. So that is Hashem's lamp. What is your lamp? That's our, the Jewish people's lamp in God's hand. It says, Ne'er Hashem Nishmas Odom. Again, the same Pasuk. The lamp of God is the soul of man. So our neshama is God's lamp. God uses our neshama. Our soul is a light force. And so we have these two sentences, Ne'er Mitzvah Vatera Er, and Ne'er Hashem Nishma Sodom, that show us that God says to man, my lamp is in your hand, and your lamp is my hand. If you guard my lamp, God is essentially saying, I'll guard yours. Aiko Aiko. If you, go, if you extinguish, God forbid, my lamp, God says, not such good things. But if you guard my lamp, you keep the Torah, you keep the mitzvahs, you keep the lamp of mitzvahs and the light of the Torah, then I will guard your soul. I will guard your neshama. I will keep your life pristine. I will keep you alive. I will give you life. So there's a great question here. Maybe you could reverse it. The pasuk, the sentence here, could be reversed. Why do we have to bring this sentence? And why shouldn't the terms maybe be reversed? Maybe we should say that our lamp is the Torah, and that lights up our lives. And, I'm sorry, the other way. Yes, our lamp is the Torah, and God's lamp is the soul. God injected the soul down here to do a job to light up his dark world. And we have a Torah that lights up our dark world. So to answer this question, we need to examine who lights the menorah and why. We have to get down to the actual situation in this week's parsha, in this week's Torah portion, that discusses Aaron and lighting the actual lamp. We have Aaron here on, on the line. So I don't know if you're, I don't think you're a Kohen. Are you a Kohen? No. Now going, <laughs> we got an Aaron though, and it says Aaron was ready of shalim. He sought peace. He ran after peace wherever it could be found. He looked for peace under every rock. He would he would show up in people's like uh, houses to make peace between husband and wife. He was an amazing man of peace, and and uh, bringing shalom amongst uh, the Jewish people. But who lights the the lamps of the menorah? It says Aaron the Kohen, the high priest, the the Kohen Gadol, not just any Kohen, but the Kohen Gadol. So he is the one to ignite and reveal the actual light of the menorah. And then it says what and why. why. Why is he the guy? It says he arouses the souls of the Jewish people that they should be absorbed by the infinite light of Hashem. He lights the menorah and this lights up, inspires, arouses, gets, gets fired up the Jewish people. And what does that do? It makes the flame of their soul reabsorbed, as it were, back into Hashem, reconnecting Hashem. We know that if fire, two fires come together, it makes a bigger fire. If we put two fires together, it makes a bigger fire, and it absorbs that fire into the fire. So one could ask the question on that. Doesn't the soul naturally want to be part of Hashem? Doesn't the soul naturally burn for God, burn on fire, be en fuego for Hashem? And the answer is yes. So if the natural state of the soul is to be on fire to Hashem and want to be close to God, to be reabsorbed into His divine light, into His divine fire, to rise up, why do we need Aaron to come and light the menorah, light up the candles, and remind us, sort of say, to be reabsorbed and to be aroused to the light of Hashem. So, one of the interesting things, I'll tell a, a quick uh, story, a narrative, 
in um, there was a, a satellite hookup for Hanukkah uh, by the Rebbe uh, right at the I believe it was 1991 and back then there wasn't Zoom like we're Zooming now to all points all over there wherever and it wasn't YouTube so a satellite hookup was very expensive and very um, very uh, complicated thing to set up it wasn't so easy to just beam satellite you know beam video all over the world but the Rebbe did it I believe in 11 countries I believe it was Russia America Australia Britain France I think Tokyo um, might have somewhere in South America I think it was 11 countries in total and they had a menorah lighting ceremony in 770 on Hanukkah um, beamed all over the world and not only was it beamed all over the world like by TV the Rebbe saw back they had the videos of what the children were doing, the, the Jews were doing all over the world. So you could see Tokyo, you could see Russia. And this is after the fall of the Soviet Union, so obviously the novelty of that and the uh, power of seeing Jews for the first time able to observe their traditions was a very powerful sight. And it was uh, broadcast on uh, TVs all over the world. And now you can see it on YouTube, of course. And it's on YouTube for uh, preserved in posterity. And it's very powerful. Oh, in Israel too, of course, what I think. Israel also, that's the point of the story. And so um, it was a powerful thing. It was very revolutionary. Like see a Hasidic Rebbe, a mystic on TV, like all over the world, like, and seeing like kids in like Tokyo and in Russia and in Australia, a very powerful thing. You could watch it on YouTube. And um, it literally beamed the menorah all over the world. It was very powerful. And so during the lighting of the menorah, each city lights the menorah. Obviously, time zones, certain places were not the right time to light the menorah. But in Israel, the chief rabbi of Israel, the chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel at that time, lights the menorah by the Western Wall, by the Kaisel, the site of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And before he lights it, he speaks. And he speaks, he says that it, when Mashiach comes, it says that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest like Aaron HaKohen, will come once again to light the menorah at the Beit HaMikdash, at the Holy Temple, when Mashiach comes. But, the, he says, and the end of our long and dark exile, one leader has lit up more souls than any Jewish leader in history, and when Aaron goes to light the menorah, he'll step aside for the Rebbe. Wow, powerful statement. And the Rebbe smiles and goes like this. <laughs> what are you talking about? Aaron's going to light the Manera. The Rebbe in his humility and also because halachically Jewish law says the Kohen Gadol's got to light the Manera. But the sentiment is very powerful. The sentiment of the, the chief Sephardic rabbi was very powerful and very um, apropos. I mean, you know, what, what, what mystical Hasidic Rebbe, what... Uh, like a Moses has a satellite hookup all over the world. There was the internet before the internet, you know, 30 years ago. So um, it was a powerful statement. And it always reminds me when I, when I learned this discourse and I learned this Parsha, it always reminds me of that, uh, that uh, menorah lighting across the world that the goal the, the, the chief rabbi was saying is lighting up souls. The menorah's goal, he's saying, intrinsically, based on Kabbalah, based on Chassidus, based on Torah, is that Aaron Akon is not just lighting up a symbolic candelabra somewhere in the base of Migdash, seven branch, beautiful gold menorah for like light or for like, you know, some symbol. It's actually causing the souls of Jews to return to their roots, to return to Hashem, to return to their creator and follow the ways of Torah. So it's a very powerful, powerful lesson that obviously was applied on that broadcast and uh, brought to literally thousands if not millions of people so again so in order to understand all this there's a bestseller the bestseller is a tell-all book called the Tanya the Tanya is the fundamental book the foundational book the essential book of Jewish mysticism in our day and age it is the quintessential book of Chabad philosophy, Chabad Hasidus, based on Kabbalah, based on the earlier Hasidus and the writings of the mystics. And it is a manual. And in that manual called the Tanya, there's a section about the source and subsequent descent of the soul. It gives a very clear picture of understanding 
how God creates souls and how those souls are created, for what purpose, what their job is, and how they're sent down and injected into the physical world in a body, and they're born. And it gives the whole pathway, the whole trajectory of the soul, and how the neshama, the soul, is supposed to act, is how it's conduct itself, and all of the obstacles that will get in its way as it comes down here into this world. Famous quote of the Baal Shem Tov says that a neshama can wear and tear and fight and have a hard life, God forbid, for 70, 80 years just to do one favor for another Jew. A person can go their whole life rebelling, fighting, having friction, God forbid, in life, having trauma in their life, having anxiety, not being connected. And then one moment will pop up somewhere in their life for 70, 80 years and they'll have the opportunity to do a favor for another Jew. It's a powerful lesson about the descent of the Shama. But the Tanya, I would say, is the best source to truly understand the process that the Neshama goes through. So, that's just parenthetical. So let's go back to Aaron. Aaron is the man. Aaron is the man. It says about Aaron, good oil from the head of Aaron descends, drips down onto the beard of Aaron, and the beard of Aaron according to his attributes, according to his character traits. So Aaron and I share a uh, beautiful beard. His beard, I think, is longer than mine. Yes? So yeah, the oil, the holy sanctity of oil rests on the head of Aaron a Cain, and it drips down his face, and it descends and goes according to his the character traits of Aaron. There's a lot of Kabbalistic things written there, but we'll discuss the beard of Aaron. The beard of Aaron, in this case, refers to the laws of the Torah. The strict black and white laws of the Torah, the way Torah is supposed to be lived, studied, and put into practice. But through the Torah, and through the laws of the Torah, the Torah of light reveals and illuminates the natural inclination of the soul to rise upward like a flame. See, it's very easy to look at the Torah and say, it's a book of laws. What to do, what not to do. It sounds very religious. It sounds very black and white. It sounds very legalistic, like either you're a good boy or you're a bad boy. Like, this is what to do. But when one understands, really, that that is merely just the bones, sort of say, of the Torah, and not the neshama, the soul of the Torah, we have to understand that the Torah we observe and keep the laws of reveals and illuminates the natural inclination we already have of our soul to return to Hashem. So meaning to say, we ask the question that why does Aaron need to do all this if the natural way of the soul is already to go up? So the answer is, the soul has many obstacles. The soul is attached to a body. The soul finds itself confounded by the materiality, by the coarseness, by the physical world. And sometimes the soul gets distracted. It gets concealed. I don't feel inspired. It doesn't feel connected. Maybe to such an extent, God forbid, where it doesn't do mitzvahs anymore. Or maybe it was born into a situation where it was never able to do mitzvahs in the first place. Like myself, or more, many of us on the broadcast right now. We're not raised observant. Say, my soul never even got a chance. I never even got the, the, the opportunity to start keeping mitzvahs from birth. Only later in life have I developed this inspiration, this, this desire to return to my roots, to be inspired, to fire up the flame of my soul. And so comes along Aaron, and he lights up the Menorah. And the beard of Aaron, the observance of Torah and Mitzvahs, they refine our character traits. It refines our characteristics of our soul. Our soul, of course, has ten powers, the ten sfirot, the ten mystical attributes that 
are godly attributes that are enmeshed into our soul. And in order for them to illuminate and be revealed to the fullest capacity, they need to be, they need to rise up like a flame. And this is caused by Aaron. So now we see the cause and the effect of Aaron's role. His role is to light up the souls of the Jewish people. If you guard my lamp, I'll guard yours. So the lamps will rise. Both lamps will rise. Guard guarding our lamp so it will not extinguish the light of our soul, whose inclination is to rise and elevate to him. Because if a flame decides to, God forbid, separate from its source, from I'm sorry, from its, um, from its fuel source, then it could extinguish. If a candle has no more wick or has no more oil or wax to burn up, the candle extinguishes. So God says, when you observe my Torah, and you're so inspired and so on en fuego I'm going to make sure your soul doesn't extirpate you your soul doesn't go up your soul doesn't leave so God is saying not only that but I'm also revealing within you the deepest light of the Torah by guarding the soul what will happen is a guarding of the light of the Torah through firing up the lamps through Aaron with the Torah as a Jew, we have the Torah. The Torah is a book of law, it's a book of philosophy, it's a book of religion, it's a book of mysticism, of spirituality, of morality, and it encompasses the totality of a Jew. And when a Jew lives according to the Torah, and breathes according to the Torah, and studies the Torah, and meditates for the Torah, then that's guarding Hashem's lamp. And that, that causes a conflagration of our soul. And that conflagration is guarded because we're guarding Hashem's Torah. We are observing His Torah. We are keeping His Torah. We are revealing His Torah in a world of darkness. We're making the world a better place through the Torah. And thereby, God says, I'm going to guard your neshama. I'm going to guard yours. But all of this happens, like the essential cog, the... the, the, um, the you know, this all hinges upon Aaron's lighting up the lamps. And this is what he does with the Torah itself and with the neshamas, the souls of the Jewish people. So, we can ask ourselves another question. The Rebbe asks another question. Are the statements interdependent? What is the relevance of if I guard if you guard my lamp, Hashem says, I will guard your lamp. Are these two independent statements or are they interdependent? So there is an amazing medrash that I'll share. In the merit of the one who created this is the account of heaven and earth. Obviously, God created this. And it says in the merit of who created this, in his merit, is the account of heaven and earth. Those who stand, who is those who stand? The names of the Jewish people who descended into Egypt. We know there were 69 Jews and 70 Jews. Really, someone was born on the way into Egypt. And these are the testimonies the statutes and the laws. These things are all merits. Meaning to say, the merit of the testimonies, the statutes and the laws of the Torah. What are those three things? They're weird English words to most of us. And they are like sound like all the same thing. Testimonies, statutes, laws. Quickly, just to understand it, there are three categories of mitzvahs in the Torah. There are mitzvahs we understand very clearly. There are mitzvahs that we don't understand at all why we do them. And then there's a middle category of things that we kind of understand. And um, I often give the example of mitzvahs we understand would be mitzvahs that are observed by most moral societies and civilizations in of humanity. Don't kill. Don't steal. Honor your parents. These are 
base level things that all human beings with a, a moral compass would arrive at, even, God forbid, without Torah or God telling them to do so. And we see it for most societies. Those are mitzvahs we understand. We do those mitzvahs because Hashem said so, not because of our own humanistic ideas or ideologies or philosophies. They are intrinsically godly, even though they make sense to the rational mind. Then, on the other side of the spectrum are mitzvahs that we do, that we have no idea why we do them. We do them because God said so. What just happened? We lost our Zoom connection for some reason. We do those mitzvahs because God, because God said so. And we do them intrinsically with the same meaning and connection to divinity that is because God said so. And a good example of that is kosher. So uh, let's get the uh, zoom back here. What happened here? We'll get our audience back shortly. We're back. I don't know what happened. I hope Something uh, happened. I don't know what happened, but we're back. Um, well, okay. Maybe Aaron okay. will get back too. I don't know what happened here. I'll check my phone. Yeah, see. like it may be the host for a second. I don't. Made you the host, really? <laughs> yeah. You're uh. You're, you're, you're the rabbi oh, in training. The three mitzvahs. What are the three mitzvahs? You're in training. Oh, the three mitzvahs. I know. That's where we're at. Good. I'm glad you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the third, the, the second category. So we gave the mitzvah. I think you guys got the mitzvah. That's the base level, right? Don't kill, don't steal. We understand those humanistically. We arrive at them logically. But we do them as Jews because God said so, even though we would arrive at them through our own logic, our own morality. The, we'll, we'll skip the middle category and go straight to the ones we don't understand. The mitzvahs we don't understand, the example that I can give is kosher. There's no reason why we can't eat milk with meat. Logically. There's no reason I can give you. In fact, today, uh, a keto diet encourages high-fat diets and high pro, more higher-protein diets somewhat. There's no dietary reason. There's no logical reason. There's no health benefits there's no um, environmental benefits not to eat meat and milk together. Why do I have to wait six hours after I eat a hamburger to eat a piece of pizza? There's no logical reason. And any rabbi that tells you there is a reason is, you know, full of it. <laughs> to say it uh, bluntly. There's no reason. We do that mitzvah because God said so. The worst answer you can give a teenager is because God said so, Right? Well, because I said so as a parent, right? I said, because I said so. You know, you're like, so why can't, can I take the car out tonight? No, why? Because I said so. No one likes that answer. But it shows you a commitment to, to the relationship. It can shows you the connection you have intrinsically with God that you do it solely because you believe in Hashem and His Torah. And you want to connect with Him. You want to have a relationship. And there's many mitzvahs in that category, very few but there are many mitzvahs in that category. Things that seem arbitrary, seem, that seem arcane and, and not, not logical. And we do those mitzvahs simply because God said so. We also don't kill because God said so. So if you look at the essence of the mitzvahs, we do them both for the same reasons. But one of them we can appeal to our logic to understand, and one we cannot. The, now the middle category. The middle category, I'll give an example of Shabbos. The middle category, again, is a mitzvah that we understand partially, but part of it doesn't make any sense. And why Shabbos? I think every culture has a day of rest. Every culture has a weekend, a siesta, 
uh, a holiday, um, a day off from work. Every culture has that. But in Judaism, we are very distinct in the way we observe our day of rest. It's not just a day off from work. There are 39 acts, laborious activities we have to refrain from on Shabbos. Why those things? Why not others? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. It is not a rational... You can't arrive at it rationally, logically. Again, there's other aspects of Shabbos that don't make sense. Why is Shabbos specifically from sundown to nighttime on Saturday, sundown Friday till nighttime on Saturday, about 25 hours? Why is Shabbos that time? Why isn't it Tuesday? Why those times? All of those things, I mean, one could say because God created the world that way and God created the world on that day, but those are not logical things. These are not things that we can arrive at with our own logic nor seek to really understand essentially. So Shabbos has in it both elements of the human element of it, but it also has in it the godly element of it. So that being said, all of those mitzvahs, all three categories of those mitzvahs, by which all 613 mitzvahs fall into one of those three categories, are all merits for us. We do them because Hashem said so. We do them because God gave it to us in the Torah as an eternal statute, eternal testimony, eternal law. And those who stand, us, the Jewish people, who are, des- or who are all descendants from the people who left Egypt, all got these merits. We have those things that keep us as a people, as Jewish people, that are really the lamp that we're guarding for Hashem in this world. There's an amazing uh, commentary on the first line of the entire Torah. The first line of the Torah is Bereshis Bora Elohim Eis Hashemayim Ve'Eis Ha'aretz In the beginning God created heaven and earth. There's a very good question as to why God began the Torah that way. Maybe the Torah should have just began with the first law or began with the uh, situation in Egypt or began with uh, the establishment of a Jewish calendar so we know when things are and how to observe God's commandments, the mitzvahs. But in the first uh, commentary on the first line of the Torah, Rashi, the most famous commentator who's considered the wine of the Torah, his commentary is on this one hand extremely literal and simple but very 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 deep uh, but very understandable and accessible and it's recommended that that's the first commentary to study on the Torah and he brings from the Talmud I believe it's Rabbi Yeshua says that this is very apropos today for what's going on in Israel that in the future non-Jews will come and claim Israel for themselves and claim that the Jewish people are robbers, are thieves, and have stolen the land. But we have the first line of the Torah saying God created all this, heaven and earth. And it's his land, it's his world, it's his universe. And he can do with it what he wants. And he can give it to whom he chooses. And so we see that God started the Torah with in the beginning Hashem created heaven and earth in order for the it's for the sake of the Jews. It's for the sake of the Jews. Even the first line of the Torah, which seems very far removed from our earthly experience, is immediately relatable to us as Jewish people. And we're given that mandate immediately to understand that God has given us a great merit. God has given us a great inheritance, a great statute for us to follow. A Jewish person is perfected by the Torah. It perfects us as individuals. It perfects the world on the whole. And in, our, in the case of our discourse, most fo- which focuses mostly on the soul, it perfects our neshama, our soul of who we are. It causes a true higher elevation of our neshama, of our soul. 
And while our soul naturally, intrinsically, wants to go back to Hashem and return to Hashem, we have a Torah that gives it a pathway and causes even a greater conflagration than we would have had, God forbid, without Torah. So the fact is that the Torah keeps us alive and going and constantly, constantly elevating to a higher and higher level. I was reading today an interesting, fascinating book of Jewish philosophy called the Kuzari. And there's also um, another book I was actually reading also studying the topic of Israel and uh, the relationship between the Jews in Israel and the Jews as God's people, as a chosen people. And the Kuzari lined up very much with a beautiful medrash. In the medrash it says that um, there was a king and he wanted to understand the truest religion and the the non-Jews had many claims against the Jewish people. One of the claims was the Arab claim and the the rabbi who was debating in front of the king answered him with a direct line from the Torah about Yishmael. The Arabic claim was that Yishmael is also a descendant. Ismael is a descendant of Abraham as well as Isaac. So why doesn't Ismael get the land of Israel? And the rabbi answers very clearly, Abraham sent away his other children, Ismael, with concubines and gifts. And to Isaac, he kept him and gave him the land of Israel. So immediately the Ishmaelites, the Arabs, their claim was negated and the king kicked them out. Came the Egyptians and the Egyptians said to the Jewish people, we demand compensation. It says in your Torah that on your way out of Egypt, you took our gold and silver. We want our, our slice of the pie. The rabbi answered, the Jews were in slavery for hundreds of years. You owe us back pay. Immediately, the Egyptians, before the calculation was even made, fleed the scene and left the king. And I'm missing one. Oh, the Canaanites. The Canaanites, the original tribe that inhabited Israel before uh, the Jews came to Israel again and returned to Israel. And the Canaanites claimed, it's our land, we were there first. And the rabbi quoted a sentence from the Torah, a passage from the Torah, discussing the abhorrent behavior of the Canaanites, how they have no right inherently to the land and that they are a um, orphaned people sort of say they are disjointed people and they have no inheritance in anything paraphrasing the point is the rabbi answered all these questions from the Torah itself he didn't make a claim coming from we are stronger we have the IDF we have bombs we have 1948 we have this victory and that victory he didn't give politics obviously it was way before those things but he didn't answer with politics he didn't answer with logic he didn't answer with with a philosophy or um, um, humanistic concepts he answered with divine answers from the Torah and this drove each of those litigants away from the presence of the king proving the validity of the Jewish people and their claim to Israel. Where did that claim come from? It came specifically through the Torah, from the Torah. All the rabbis' answers and retorts were from the Torah and were accepted by the non-Jews. This is a great lesson for us today. If our retort is based on what Congress says or what United Nations say or what even the Knesset says or a prime minister says, or based on an army, or based on technology, or Nobel Prizes, 
we're going to lose the battle. We're going to lose the conversation, the debate, God forbid. But if we answer exclusively and clearly from the Torah, from a divine mandate, then we'll be successful. Then our retort and our answers and our battles, God forbid, if we have to have them, will be in fact successful. So it's a powerful lesson for us to understand the Torah is what protects us. We protect the Torah, the Torah protects our soul. The Torah protects our holy land. The holiness of the Torah and a Jew keeping the holy Torah protects our holy land, our holy people, and of, of course our holy neshama that the Rebbe is talking about in this discourse. So, one of the questions one might think of, if the soul is so divine and intrinsic, why does it need so much protecting? Maybe it's powerful enough as it is. Maybe it uh, doesn't need anything else to keep it alive, to keep it going, to keep it on fire. So we say, Oy vey, a blemish on the soul, God forbid. How can a soul even go against God's will? How can a Jew, God forbid, go against God's will? It's almost an impossibility. In fact, it is really, if you look at it from the real highest levels, an impossibility. So the soul has roots. The soul has roots in four worlds. Atsilus, Bria, Yetzira, Asiya. Four divine worlds. They're not physical. They're spiritual levels. And the question is, where is your soul rooted from? Is it rooted from the highest world? Or the lowest world? Or somewhere in between, which is probably most, uh, most likely. Without going into the depth of the four worlds according to Kabbalah, which we've probably mentioned before in this class, the highest world, Atzilus, is connected in totality to Hashem, to God. It's a godly world in purity. In fact, in some ways and expl explanations, Atzilus, the highest world, is not even a world, it's just God Himself. It's connected so much to Hashem that if we were actually able to perceive that spiritual level, we would just feel Hashem. The second to highest level is Bria, which is the world of creation, where here we begin to experience the concept of other. There's Hashem, and there seems to be other. There seems to be something distinct, created by God, not just God Himself. Then we have the world of Yetzira, the third to highest or second to lowest world. And this world is an admixture of Hashem, God's emanations, and other. I won't say bad, but more created. And it's almost like 50-50, where it's, it's godly, but there seems to be manifestations of form almost on some level. And here you have the more disparate relationship between God and His creation. And the lowest world, Asiya, is a world of action, where you have almost perceivably very little of Hashem. All you have is a feeling of spirituality, but mostly materiality, mostly corporeal existence things that are distinct and fully disparate from Hashem we don't see their source we don't see what they actually are where they actually are coming from rather from Hashem and in that you have the physical world the lowest part of Atzilus the physical Gashmi world which is a physical world which has no spirituality and it seems completely detached from its source and God. And that's the world we inhabit physically. But obviously as Jews, we're constantly tapping into higher spiritual levels. But we could ask ourselves a question. Which level does our soul come from? And it's a great question. And it's one something to meditate on, to study about, and to ponder ourselves.
We also have something that is an enemy of our godly soul, and that is the animal soul. It's an enemy of our godly soul. Animalistic tendencies. Tendencies we wish we didn't have. Behaviors we wish we didn't exhibit. Cravings and desires that are antithetical to our neshama, to our soul's best interests. So in order to combat that animalistic soul, that that nefesh bahamis, as it's called in Hebrew, we need a universal fuel of the Torah. We need to guard our soul. And even the souls from the highest level, even the souls from Atsilus, need to guard their souls with the universal fuel of the Torah, the oil of the Torah. And this ensures that if we're constantly on fire, conflagrated for Hashem, then we will win the war against our animalistic tendencies and the soul will be inspired. I'm going to leave it there on this concept because the next section of the discourse is actually a very interesting diversion for the trajectory the discourse has gone on until now. The next section, which God willing will revisit next week, will be a level of the divine soul that even transcends the Torah. I mean, with that statement alone, you can understand why we're going to stop there for today because I don't want to leave you with a completely unanswered question. But we have to understand, I'll leave you with this, that the soul in its pristine, highest way completely transcends everything. Even is not dependent on the Torah for its conflagration. But yet we know that the Torah is also intrinsically transcendent of everything. So we'll leave it there. And next week I'll begin the class, God willing, with a little um, review of what we did this week. And then we'll jump into this next question, almost this next, uh, completely next period of this discourse itself. And uh, we will discuss it then, God willing. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you next week and at the next class. And uh, feel free to, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, because I'm saving it to YouTube, uh, like, subscribe, and uh, check out the next class on the same topic, part two. Thanks so much. Thank you.